Welcome to the first module of the Foundational Skills mini course. This is module one, Foundational Nuts and Bolts. And I'm Carrie Swanson. And I remain David Lieben. Just a reminder of who Student Achievement Partners is and what we do. Uh, Student Achievement Partners is a nonprofit organization um, who works with teachers and those who support teachers. Our work is grounded in research and evidence, um, and our resources are all available on our website, Achieve the Core, um, so definitely feel free to check those out. Our goals for this module are to identify the components of foundational skills and distinguish how uh, those components hit uh, the grade levels, kindergarten, first, and second grade by focus, um, and also to determine the structure and the content of the foundational skills mini course as a whole. There are a few different ways uh, that we've built into this course to make it as interactive as possible in a virtual environment. Uh, first of all, to allow you time to engage with others, um, there are opportunities in each module to pause and have a discussion. When you see the keyboard, uh, that signals a online discussion. Uh, you can pause the webinar and go right to Schoology to engage in the dialogue, or you can do it later in the week. Um, but that's a chance for you to interact with your colleagues that are taking this course across the country. There's also pause points during the webinar to engage with the content, um, either individually or with colleagues in the room right then. Um, and then at the end of each module, there are weekly connect to practice tasks. Um, there are role-based options, whether you're in a school or whether you're outside of a school in an organizational setting. And there's also uh, optional recommended reading each week. And because we have different roles, teachers in the classroom, administrators, coaches, and others, the goals here are twofold. One, to learn as much as possible in this course about foundational skills, and two, to be able to turn around and convey that information to others in your school and in, and in your district. Many of you have probably seen the three shifts that, that we've had for quite a while at Student Achievement Partners. But just to go over them briefly, the three shifts that we feel are necessary to succeed in the era of the Common Core Standards are complexity, regular practice with complex text and its academic language, academic language meaning vocabulary and syntax, and this does not mean that everything children should read needs to be complex or in the band with complexity, but everybody needs that opportunity to work with complex text because frankly, without that, you won't succeed, and that's what we've been doing for about 30 years, and it hasn't made a dent in the achievement gap. Evidence, ground reading, writing, and speaking in evidence from the text, and that is both literary and informational. In addition to the obvious importance of evidence, it brings children back into the text when you focus on evidence, and going back into the text enhances academic language, enhances every part of the reading process. Knowledge, to build knowledge through content-rich nonfiction over the course of the year. So those are our three shifts. And the foundational skills that's the focus of this course is not a shift. Um, it's stayed the same. Uh, however, we have thought about whether it should be called perhaps the fourth shift in order to just signal the importance to the field. David's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges in teaching foundational skills and its importance. Probably the greatest challenge is that the research base of, of foundational skills is overwhelming for half, literally half a century. Yet consistently that research base has been challenged um, and people have moved in the direction of implementation of foundational skills that is not research-based. And that has clearly not worked. Some of you, if you're um, unfortunate enough to be as old as I am, um, might know about the Reading Wars, which took place in the 80s and 90s. And those Reading Wars still go on. Um, in fact, very similar to the Korean War, which is in the news lately, um, there has not been a peace treaty with the Reading Wars. There was at times a ceasefire, and I think the Common Core, uh, in, in essence, challenged that ceasefire. And we have people, because of the Reading Wars, resisting the research-based foundational skills approach. And it's often, because of these other two factors, it's often ignored in, P, in PD. 
And all of these areas are of extreme importance. If, if instruction is not research driven and based on proven research, it simply doesn't work for the majority of students. It will work for some, but it will not work for the vast majority of students if it's not clearly research based. Foundational skills is harder than they seem. It's, it's a body of knowledge that needs to be learned and acquired. And the, you know, the best way to learn something is when you have to teach it. Um, when I started teaching my first year, shortly after the Civil War, um, in rural Wisconsin, I had to teach fifth grade science. My four years at the University of Wisconsin did not teach me much science. I had to learn what I taught, and it was the most solid way to learn something. And you're going to have to teach foundational skills, and you're going to have to teach it to other people. And learning it as solid as possible is essential for that, for that reason. Again. There are some children who will thrive in a program that is not research-based. They tend to be children from high knowledge or, or literacy-rich families, but it is overwhelmingly clear, and the data for the last 25 or so years has shown that those children we need to help the most need to receive a research-based instruction. And I think, David, we talk about how it's critical for some, but uh, it is absolutely beneficial for all. So I think we talk a lot about my own daughter who's in first grade um, and she hasn't had a structured phonics program and she can read quite well, um, but she struggles with spelling, she struggles with writing. Uh, there's absolutely nothing that wouldn't uh, simply enhance her instruction if she was getting systematic structured phonics as well. So critical for some and beneficial for, for everyone. That's absolutely true. And the research bears that out. Children who do learn quickly um, become much better spellers as a, as a result of doing a structured phonics program. I would like to add on a very personal note that I should have realized that we needed to give more attention to foundational skills right from the start. I should have known better based on my experience that I shared with you in our opening presentation, and I didn't. And I, with all my heart and all my mind, hope that we're making up for that now. So with that, I wanted to give you a chance to think about the challenges of foundational skills and the fact that David just mentioned that it's harder uh, than it looks and harder than some people might know. Um, so the words that I'm flashing on the screen are an example of some of the challenging content we're discussing. Um, if you'd like to test your knowledge or you'd like to test the knowledge of your coworkers right now, or if you need a do now for an upcoming staff meeting demonstrating the content needs uh, of this PD. The um, bit.ly URL on the screen um, gives you access to a word sort where you can really kind of go into uh, detail about how challenging this content actually is. Um, we know that there's a lot to learn and we know that there's really good stuff in our course will be an overview, um, but a lot more work will still be needed. Um, and with that, teachers need professional development uh, in order to focus on this work. So there is actually a research base uh, behind that as well. A couple of quotes here from, uh, from Louisa Motes uh, for you. Um, she actually, the title of her article is Teaching Reading is Rocket Science, um, where she speaks about how uh, teacher preparation really needs to emphasize uh, conflicts of language, but usually doesn't. Many of you probably uh, did not learn the nuances of early childhood reading in your teacher preparation programs. And if you did, then you are actually in the anomaly. Um, a, a sort of summary here from a couple of uh, researchers around effective instruction about print and its meaning and the fact that that enables teachers to be successful with high need students. Um, so we know that it's, uh, that it's really important to bring uh, time to teachers to make sure that they are able to hone their craft in this way. I would just like to add at this point, Louisa Motes was one of the two writers of the Common Core Foundational Skills Standards, the other being Marilyn Adams. And we uh, are greatly indebted to Marilyn Adams' work for a lot of the work that we've done for this course um, and for the supporting resources as well. Um, and for you all, uh, there are professional development resources for this course to kind of help make sure uh, that you have as much as we can get you um, to support your work. So the guidance documents that you uh, should have downloaded on the course's launch um, and are also linked to the modules on Achieve the Core 
Uh, the weekly modules, of which there'll be seven, um, you'll have the, uh, the content and the related tasks. You'll have the PowerPoint as well as the recorded webinar. Um, and then our weekly office hours where we are um, holding live times to respond to content from the online discussions or from the connect to practice tasks. Um, so those are the resources we'll be offering you throughout this course. Whenever uh, we get to a blue slide in the module, so you can expect that there'll be a task. Um, so this uh, blue slide with the keyboard sh shows that there's an online discussion, um, which will come up on our, on our next slide. This is your first online discussion opportunity. And just a reminder that that's where we'll be uh, getting information, both the instructors, um, the SAP's literacy team, and the core advocates who are uh, teaching assistants for this course. We'll be monitoring those discussions um, to help respond to trends on our office hours. So for this first opportunity, um, we just want to get a chance to get to know what you hope to get out of this course and let you use the chat as an opportunity to start an online dialogue with the course participants. Um, we know some of you are probably just here, as David said before, to improve your own content knowledge, some probably to support a district or schools, uh, curriculum options. Um, others are probably here to coach or work with others um, or to uh, just learn new ideas for implementation. Those of you who are teachers who already know the priority but just want to hear guidance or instruction. Um, so by choosing uh, kind of the goal that best matches what you hope for the course, we hope you'll be able to uh, use that chance this week to talk to others who have the same goal as you. You can pause the webinar now and go to Schoology and do that, or you can keep listening and do that later in this week. So we're gonna move now into the content goals for today's module. Um, so the components of the uh, Common Core Standards for foundational skills are print concepts, phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, and fluency. If you're working in a state that has uh, adapted state-specific standards, um, rest assured there is a lot of overlap, almost entirely. Um, there may be a few standards with words that are slightly altered, and you can investigate that on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, but the vast majority of states have kept very true uh, to most of the content of the Common Core, and especially in foundational skills. There's virtually no, the change is at minimal at best in foundational skills right. and everything really, but especially foundational skills. So as we, we're going to go through each sort of category and I'll let you know how we'll be talking about that category more throughout the course, um, starting with print concepts. So print concepts refer to the organization and the basic features of print. This is primarily a kindergarten set of standards. So we've got dark green for kindergarten. In first grade, uh, we move to knowledge of sentences, so capitalization and punctuation. And by second grade, print concepts is complete. Um, in kindergarten, we're talking about the ideas that uh, words consist of letters, that letters represent words, that there's spacing between words that you read from left to right and from top to bottom. Um, but what is most important to focus your time on in kindergarten is the knowledge of letters. Um, we are absolutely saying that knowledge of letters includes the sounds that they make. And we know that that's critical, that knowledge of letters and sounds is critical to kindergarten and should be uh, the focus of instruction in early kindergarten. Keep in mind here that one of the reasons why print concepts is not terribly time consuming is when you're doing reading aloud, and you're holding up a book and reading aloud to children, you're also doing print concepts. That's not foundational skills, read aloud. That's to develop vocabulary and knowledge and the structure of text. But every time you do a read aloud, you're also teaching print concepts. So really, when you're teaching print concepts in kindergarten and first grade, a lot of that can be embedded in your other instruction. That's what David's talking about. Um, reinforcing it with anything that's book-based. Um, it shouldn't take much time. Uh, we do know that some kindergartners are going to walk in the door completely familiar with a lot of these concepts based on their past experience, and some aren't. So uh, that is a good chance to start sort of equalizing things from the get-go in kindergarten, um, but definitely not a lot of instructional time spent there. Right. Uh, we have a couple of examples of what it looks like to reinforce this um, within the context of a lesson, right? So you might be 
uh, just uh, reading a letter from the principal and you help show that you're starting at the top line in order to go down the page. Um, or reading a read aloud and show how, oops, I, I skipped a section. I have to make sure that I read the words under the picture because there's words there too. So just connecting it right to what you're already doing. That's it for print concepts. Um, we will embed some of those in our own modules, but we won't be spending a lot of time uh, on them outside of that. Uh, but our next bucket is phonological awareness. Um, again, it's kindergarten and first grade, with the bulk of emphasis really strong in kindergarten, but continuing through first, and complete by second grade. Uh, we will spend a lot of time, we'll spend all of the next module talking in depth about this area of focus. So a quick summary for you now is, uh, Phonological awareness is understanding of spoken words, syllables, and sounds. Um, when we're talking about the individual <laughs> sounds within words, those are phonemes. Um, and we will start in kindergarten uh, with knowledge of sounds and then move into knowledge of phonemes. Um, and in first grade, uh, building on that phonemic awareness um, and blending and segmenting syllables. Anything else to add there? Nope. <laughs> That's it. You'll hear a lot in module two. And then our next area of focus is phonics and word recognition. See this as a lot darker green across the grades. Um, this is a huge focus of instruction um, for kindergarten through second grade. Kindergarten as soon as letter recognition is secure um, and first and second grade. Um, phonics begins with connecting what we just talked about, knowledge of phonemes. Um, to graphemes. Uh, graphemes are letters or groups of letters that represent sounds. Um, it builds through first and second grade. Uh, more and more complicated sound and spelling patterns will be added um, so that students are able to read and decode more and more words on their own. So this is a big area of focus. Um, and as such, we have two modules, uh, modules three and four, that are dedicated to phonics instruction. You will see in in whatever program, in all likelihood, in whatever program you're using, in kindergarten, phonological awareness will continue throughout the year, even after actual phonics is taught. So the, the two talk to each other. By learning phonics, it reinforces what students are lear have learned and are learning with phonological awareness. And it's not a lockstep thing where phonological, in most programs, where phonological awareness is done and you move into phonics. They overlap considerably in almost every program we've looked at. It's another both ands. Yes, it's David another likes both ands. ands. <laughs> as many of you know. <laughs> it's a famous paper, as a matter of fact, written with that title. It may be written by Leaven and Leaven. You should check it out if you haven't, it's on Achieve the Core. Um, okay, so continuing, our next area of focus is fluency. Um, fluency also is a category from kindergarten through second grade. Um, in kindergarten, the focus is just reading with purpose and understanding, um, whereas in first grade, uh, students are moving towards a uh, focus on accuracy, um, and as they become more accurate, as they're able to decode with accuracy, you then start focusing with them on uh, rate and expression, um, which continues in second grade, and that becomes really important in second grade. Uh, because in second grade, uh, that is when uh, grade level complexity requirements begin. So students in second grade then have to uh, start to read uh, complex texts uh, independently and uh, with proficiency. A lot of you have maybe heard me say in, in other contexts that fluency does not guarantee comprehension, but lack of fluency guarantees lack of comprehension for the vast majority of students, and especially with complex text. It, it, there's a similar uh, process in play here. Decoding does the ability to decode, to master phonics, spelling sound patterns, does not guarantee fluency. It may be that students who've mastered this still need to understand how to pause between sentence boundaries, to pause between parts within the sentence, and that needs to be learned also. So that's why decoding does not guarantee fluency. But lack of decoding guarantees lack of fluency. If you're struggling with each word, then you're not going to be able to read with fluency. Again, there may be children who recognize each word with automaticity, but do not have fluency. They kind of read, when they read, they sound like R2-D2. That's not fluent reading. 
So there's this connection between all three here that moves these kinds of progressions are going to be throughout this course. You'll see them. Yep. We, uh, we don't have a separate module on fluency for that reason, but it's connected to our fifth module, which focuses on early reading, um, and our sixth module, which focuses on practice. Um, so in general, this is kind of a, a summary, a visual summary of the four areas of foundational skills, and the color coding helps allocate grade level priorities. Um, but as we've talked about, it doesn't indicate uh, in no way should those squares be equal in terms of instructional priorities. And I think when you look at it, if you look at the top print concepts, it's in kindergarten strongly, but not a lot of time for the reasons we discussed earlier. And maybe a little bit in the beginning of first grade, because when students come back from the summer, we know that they sometimes forget things, just as we do. And therefore, you might have a little bit of it in first grade, and that's what the color represents there. We're focusing on sentences, understanding sentences. Yes, which happens in first grade. exactly. Yeah. Phonological awareness, essential throughout kindergarten, and certainly when they come back in the beginning of first grade. And you can see with the color, it gets more attention in first grade by far than print concepts. As opposed to phonics and word recognition, which is essential K to two essential and a huge part of every one of those years. Fluency, very little, basically none, almost none in kindergarten. It begins to pick up, if you look at the colors, um, whoever did this did really well. Um, that, David. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we did really well with that. It's kind of towards the last parts of first grade, maybe the third part, the last trimester of first grade, and maybe some students are picking it up in the middle of first grade overwhelming importance in second grade. In Meredith and my school, we pounced on fluency, and that was one of the reasons that we had such success. Fluency, in addition to being essential, it kind of goes back and makes up for any weaknesses that kids have. If kids weren't quite strong enough as they needed to be on multisyllabic words, a strong fluency program cements that. And you'll see that when we get to that in, in our module. So this is our first um, uh, pause point. You can see a couple of those clicks, guys. We're a little bit late. Um, but this is our first pause point for the course. Um, so this is the opportunity for you, again, to engage with the content. Um, so if you're with your colleagues, please work with them. And if you're not, uh, hold yourself accountable to really working to digest the content first uh, before you resume the webinar. Uh, this task is to identify the appropriate grade level, uh, the tasks along the left, um, and the appropriate uh, area of focus. So you can note the grade level and which of the foundational skills buckets the task uh, would fit into. Uh, pause the webinar and do this task, and uh, you can use either the slides or you have in your handout um, a uh, a representation of those slides, or you can use the Common Core Standards uh, to do these tasks. Uh, and when you're done, please press play again, and we'll, we'll reveal the answers. And I would urge you to do it in the, in the spirit of Nike, which when I think about it is an irregularly spelled word. Um, <laughs> just do it. It really helps to do this, and I think it helps to do it now. All right, so welcome back. Uh, if you are ready for your answers, we'll reveal them right now. Um, you can cross-check them, pause if you'd like to cross-check um, and see whether you were able to match the task uh, to the grading skill. And we're gonna continue now, just a quick uh, summary of the course modules we talked about as we were going along. Um, but you can see uh, the next module will be all on phonological awareness. After that, two modules on phonics, uh, We'll move into module five. We're really talking about early reading, foundational reading. Um, then we'll have a lot of uh, examples of practice and how to assess uh, strong from weak practice in module six um, and connect back again to reading fluency. And module seven is all about assessment. Um, I'm going to move into a couple of instructional guidelines now, um, just best practices for teachers. Um, in terms of uh, how you are teaching the content of foundational skills. And we have a few guidelines that uh, we think are really important to, to share in the classroom. The first one is uh, enhancing these lessons and making sure they're fun. 
I, I think this one of the reasons that people have had trouble with phonics over the years, and, and I mentioned this in our in our opening, is that for too long a period of time it was taught really dryly. Um, people did not include enough music, enough movement, enough games. Phonics really lends itself to this kind of this kind of full body activity. And there's no reason to not do it as, as often as possible. In addition to the fact that the research shows it makes it more effective, um, kids like to move around and kids like to be active. And we're talking about young children here. So the more active, the more fun, the more music you can make it, the absolute better it is. There's no reason why phonics lessons can't resemble a Broadway musical a fair amount of the time. And you have a sample list. It's in the guidance documents. It's also in your handout of just games and tasks that you can, uh, that you can use in the classroom. So just a quick note, uh, students don't need to repeatedly practice content that they've already learned. So no teachers and students really benefit from routines. Um, when you are doing these uh, engaging songs and activities and chants, just make sure that you're retiring old content and, and repurposing it so that it reflects the new learning. And you can, with enhancements, you can do that very nicely. If, if once students have mastered the essentials of the short A sound ballet, they can then easily move into the short E sound ballet or jazz dance or rap. <laughs> so our next, our next guideline is around practice. Lots of times for uh, students to practice in reading, in writing, and orally. And I, I think I talked about this in the, in the opening session, but the variance between what students need is enormous. There are some students who learn to read in the womb. Um, there are some students who will need an incredible amount of practice. And you need to be aware of that. And you need to be able, hopefully you will have a program that provides abundant, easily implemented practice. We don't have enough teachers or enough parents or enough assistants to be with every child every moment of their learning. So you have to be sure that your program or your work has materials that can be done independently. And once students have learned an element of phonics, once they've learned how to do a short A, how to recognize short A words, but their some are slower than others and haven't reached automaticity, that practice can come in many forms that students can do independently. It could be games, it could be listening activities with paper and writing, or it could be worksheets. We now have a fair amount of research to show that if you use worksheets, you will not go to hell. And they really fit well with independent practice. Uh, the cartoon on the screen in front of you was inspired by uh, reflections of Dr. David Page, who we've worked with, um, who talked about actually students doing a written task as cementing the learning. It actually allows them to process what they've heard, to think, and to write um, to sort of seal the deal for that learning. So aside from where you won't go, it also can be helpful to students um, to make sure that they are given that opportunity. Um, and for practice, uh, practice should be in and out of context. We will talk about this a lot in module five, um, but it means that students are practicing the new skill. In this picture, they're uh, practicing words with the long I spelled I consonant E, um, both in writing as the skill itself, just building words, and then also in reading, in texts that allow them to uh, read for meaning. Um, and so doing both in and out of context is also something that we're, uh, that we're really wanting to make sure to speak to and we'll talk a lot about. All of this work is outcome oriented. Um, so we're keeping the end in mind. We're thinking about the fact that in the, at the end of this instruction, we wanna have students that are happy and engaged readers and writers. Um, and so all of the content and all of the guidance that we offer comes from research uh, that focuses on the habits of proficient readers. Um, and we're working from the lens of what we know about what skillful readers do. So what we've done is we've consolidated and we've uh, synthesized uh, research-based best practices. Um, we try to present them so that they are actionable for teachers, that they are not full of jargon. Um, and that they connect to best practices. Um, and so 
for that end, uh, right now, we've identified some key takeaways for instruction um, based on the knowledge of what early readers do. Um, we want to just make sure to sort of credit the work that we're drawing from. So just a quick summary of work that we've pulled from and researchers that we've borrowed from here. Well, as, as you can see, we started with the Common Core Standards in this area. Beginning to Read was a book written in 1990 by Marilyn Adams, possibly the only book ever commissioned by the United States Congress. Of course, at this point, we don't want them to commission any books. But in 1990, they actually commissioned the book on Beginning to Read to get out into the educational world what is the right way to deal with beginning reading. That was written by Marilyn Adams, who was also one of the, as I said earlier, one of the writers of the Common Core Foundational Skills Standards. The National Reading Panel was a multi-million dollar study that didn't look at one or two pieces of research, but looked at almost, almost a thousand pieces of research to determine what does research show us is the optimal way to get as many children as possible reaching fluency by the time they reach the third grade. That was the National Reading Panel. We employed the research from that study a great deal. And I think I mentioned it in our, in our opening session and the same kind of study was duplicated in the United Kingdom. The, on the right are some of the people that we've used in pulling this together, Marilyn and, Adams. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, and if you want um, to know more about the articles that they've written or to have, uh, to have more in-depth information, we can also um, definitely share some of those resources and some of those are throughout our recommended reading. Yes, so you see their names there. Deb Glazer, Linnea Erie, Louisa Motes, David Page, Mark Seidenberg, and Tim Shanahan, who a lot of you are familiar with on some level. Great. So uh, this is your first connect to practice task. Um, so each week there'll be a practice task that connects uh, to your work, and you have to make it personal to your work world. Um, Often there'll be two options, one that's a school specific option um, and one that can be done for those who work in an educational organization um, or a district. Um, if you have a core program for phonics, please use that program whenever, uh, whenever the task connects to curriculum. And if you don't, uh, you can use an open education resource. Um, Common, core Knowledge Language Arts Skills Strand is available. Uh, the full thing is available online. We also have several others that we've linked to um, in our templates that are on Schoology. So for this week, uh, we want you to evaluate your own program. Um, we have a checklist, the Features of a Structured uh, Foundational Skills Checklist, and it matches a lot of the points that David made in our opening. Um, and you can use that in option A with your district's approach or your school's approach to foundational skills. And in option B, you can use that with a sample curriculum, um, your choice uh, based on one you have access to or one that's available online. Um, so that's your task for this week. And please uh, post that on Schoology so that we can take a look and see uh, where folks are coming from and what they've learned about their own programs. As we uh, continue, we've got uh, recommended reading for you this week, which is uh, really connecting to uh, what is good for early learners. So uh, David uh, co-wrote this paper um, with a colleague, Silas, uh, and it is uh, myths versus facts in terms of what the Common Core Standards say for kindergarten. Um, there's a bitly uh, link to that as well. Um, and uh, just a quick reminder for you all, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you want to check out Achieve the Core, there's a whole range of resources there. There's professional learning, professional development modules. There are tools uh, for teachers and coaches um, for lesson planning and for coaching. And then there are classroom resources. There are uh, lessons that you can use, borrow, or adapt. Um, and we encourage you to, to check those out. If you want to know more about being involved with our organization, the Core Advocate Network is a thriving network that uh, works to support our work and support the work of schools. Um, you can get involved through an online survey or by emailing uh, the information on your screen. And uh, if you want to stay connected with us, um, check out, again, our website or our Facebook or our Twitter or our Pinterest pages. Um, feel free to tweet about what you, uh, what you learned today. And we look forward to uh, continuing this work with you. I want to add one thing. The 
the um, work for this week with the two options to look at your program could be, I, I've done it with a number of people and they found it re terribly revealing. And it's not a coincidence that I chose terrible. Um, <laughs> weak programs became very obvious to them. So it would be a great, it would be a great thing to, to do that this week. Thank you all so much. We look forward to talking on Office Hours and the next module. Bye, everybody.